My name is Julie Matvijek. I've been working for Symantec for 15 years, and I would like to talk to you about false positives. Um, can you raise your hand if you're in the security industry? Oops. This is not a security talk. This is aimed at software development, people. Obviously, it can be in both. Like, it's security software. This is about our problem with false positives, how we've been fighting it through the years, and uh, what's left, what's the last mile that we can't cover. So it started off with a question that, I was, um, that was put to me a few years ago when I was watching Roland Garros with a friend. And he said to me, why do tennis players still miss their serve? They have full control over the serve, and they train for this all day long, all their lives. And it was obvious to me that once you reach 100% accuracy, you just hit harder. So then it's a trade-off between the speed of the ball uh, and the strength of the hit, and obviously the accuracy. But for him, it wasn't obvious at all. And it got me thinking, is this what software developers might think of us? Because I work in preventing false positives and preventing mistakes from the security software industry. And I can never get it 100% right. There's always one thing that goes wrong. In fact, there's more than one thing every year that goes wrong. So when I go to a conference, there's usually a security conference or a development conference, or there's a security track or a development track. But it's never a place where everybody talks together. They're very, very segregated. And I think most of the problem comes from that disconnect. I think we should talk more together. So why is this a problem? Um, in Symantec, we have 24,000 disputes. We had 24,000 disputes last year. That's 24,000 customers who complained about a detection on a file. And when we analyzed it, the vast majority of them were wrong detections. So most cases, when they take the trouble of complaining about it, um, it, it's them who are right, and the, the detection is wrong on that particular file. That's counting files only. Not traffic, not websites that we classify, just files on the endpoint. 24,000 last year. It seems like a high number. Um, but we do have a lot of checks in place, um, and proportionally, there's uh, 10 million files a day that are analyzed and classified. So 24,000 mistakes a year, 10 million files a day, proportionally is quite low. But the potential harm is quite high because the system runs on 55 million endpoints. So in the worst case scenario where we would hit on a clean file that is clean software, that is not malicious, that is useful for something that everybody has, the potential damage is hitting 55 million endpoints, 55 million devices or people that could be affected. Like hopefully, this never happens, but it's quite a high risk, so we do focus on this problem a lot. Um, what could be the consequences, should you care, if you're a software developer? Well, your customers can be affected, your sales can be affected. It can be a minor inconvenience. For example, you come home tonight from a long, hard day's work, you want to play your favorite game. Computer says no. Computer says no because the first thing that the game the, uh, launcher does is to run the updater. And the updater um, goes and tries to fetch some binary from a site maybe hosted on an S3 bucket on Amazon. And the security software decides that it's suspicious. It's not sure what it's downloading, why it's downloading something. It's wrong, though. It's not doing anything harmful. So this shouldn't happen. This is definitely a mistake on the security software part. You should be able to go home and play and do whatever you want with your computer. It's your computer. But this is actually quite common. If you look at the other half of the screen, this is a website that um, proposes free small games, like point and click, <coughs> escape the room, puzzles, things like that. Um, and they have this problem so often that they are tired of explaining it. They just put it in their FAQ, and they say, um, we've had this problem with security software. Sometimes it detects our games. We have found that in the past, 100% of the time, it was them who were wrong, and our games were safe. And I believe that. Um, we actually partnered with this site a little bit to try and improve the, the quality of the detections on, on their site 
for a while. It, it was very FP prone at some stage. It's kind of resolved now. But it, it's quite common. But still, it's only a game. You know, you can exclude it if you know how. If you don't know how, you can try again in a couple hours when the mistake is fixed. There, there can be worse scenarios. You can lose some productivity. Um, there was an issue last year where um, an, a, um, a security software company detected SharePoint JavaScript and Nuke JavaScript sites for uh, n n Nuke Sharp, SharePoint sites for a lot of companies, a lot of their customers. Um, that affected them pretty badly. There was also a time where half the security industry all made the same mistake at the same time. They detected BlueJeans software. That's a video uh, conferencing software, kind of like WebEx or Skype. And they all made the same mistake on the same file at the same time. That's pretty interesting root cause analysis. If I have time, I'll get into it at the end of this presentation. Um, so those customers could not have their meetings that day. Their video conferencing software wasn't working. It was nuked by the security software. It's still not the worst that can happen. The worst that can happen is this, pretty much Armageddon. If you're working in QA, I've been working in QA for 15 years, this is the worst nightmare. Take down a hospital, take down a university. Uh, I've blacked out, obviously, uh, the company to whom it happened. It wasn't mine, luckily enough. Uh, <laughs> or maybe thanks to me. <laughs> um, it happened that there was a botched update and they disabled a critical system file. This happened 10 years ago. And the reason I'm bringing it up, because it's a good example of the worst that can happen, but the reason I'm bringing it up, even though it's 10 years old, is just to point out that it is 10 years old and that they've probably improved their systems to a point where it's not possible to do this nowadays. I haven't found anything on that scale that happened since. Um, I've been looking. But I haven't found anything that bad that happened since. So even back then, I started working for Symantec in 2005. And I assume this is another big company as well. So I assume that their systems are kind of similar. And they were evolving through the years. And we built a lot of guide rails and a lot of trip switches that can prevent that kind of stuff. I think even back then, a lot of things must have gone wrong all at once on the same day for this to happen. I don't think it's possible that it will happen again. But still, false positives happen. They can have consequences. So it, it is a problem that exists. Before I get into why and how we can prevent it, um, I need to give a bit of context. So security software does not just recognize malware that is seen before. It weighs the pros and cons and weighs all kinds of factors. Machines, the same way when you have a self-driving car, it takes uh, several sensors to decide whether there's an obstacle or not, or what to do. It doesn't just rely on one single sensor to decide whether to trigger the emergency brake uh, or a plane. Um, it's the same for security software. It, it analyzes an array of clues, an array of information, some contextual information, and some information that's found in the software itself. And it decides um, should it detect it or not. So for example, is the software assigned? Does it have a visible presence? Is it not trying to hide itself? Um, does it come from a trusted source? If I download it from, um, from Google and it's signed by Google um, and it claims to be Google Drive, it probably is. Um, or is it rare? Does no one else have? Is it trying to hide itself? Um, as well as what it actually does. So where it comes from, um, whether it's trying to hide itself is, is just as important. So obviously, the problem happens when clean software ends up in the middle. It can end up in the middle for two reasons. One, there are elements in it that drag it towards the red zone, that mislead the security software into thinking, well, it looks clean, but also looks a little bit dodgy. I'll get into that later. But the main reason that we have false positives is when it ends up in the corner. There's not enough information to decide either way. That information's been lost. So how does it get lost? It's because the security stack 
is um, layered. You call it a security stack, security software. I've never said so far, I've never said antivirus. We're not talking about antivirus specifically. We're talking about security software. So it's got all kinds of layers. The outer layers are trying to protect your environment. They're trying to uh, look at traffic, the uh, firewall, the intrusion prevention system. The middle layers are on the endpoint, protecting against malware, threat, behaviors, heuristics, stuff like that. And at the core, you have your data backup. That's what we will rely on when everything goes wrong. So these are all the layers of protection. They don't all work the same way, and they don't all work together. You're obviously perfectly entitled to buy uh, protection or firewall from one brand and endpoint protection from another brand. So they don't always communicate. The outer layers are where you expect most of the threats to be blocked. The customers demand that most threats should be blocked before they get to the endpoint. So when something gets to the endpoint, gets blocked by the antivirus on the endpoint, it's recognized and it's neutralized. Instead of celebrating, they go, well, why did you let it go that far? And it's a very fair question. We shouldn't let it go that far. We should block most of it on the outer layers. The outer layers, however, they cannot take time to analyze anything. They cannot impact the speed of the traffic or whatever you're doing or your downloads. So they cannot have any resources to try and decrypt files that you're downloading, try to reassemble all the packets from the traffic. They have to take a snap decision. It's mostly based on signatures, and it's mostly based on source and destination, whether that traffic looks odd or is known to look odd. Um, the inner layers, so they, they don't have the same, the same resources to make the decision. The inner layers have more resources. They have CPU. They have more time. They can decrypt things. They can look inside a file. They can look for strings. They can try to emulate something to see what it does, or they can let it run and observe it and monitor it. And they can take more time and resources to take a decision based on what it does. But they lose all the information, the contextual information, that they would have used to weigh the pros and cons. So for example, they might not know where the file comes from originally. If you're deploying software in your company, you're probably not going to get 6,000 endpoints to connect to the source origin of the software, and download it from the same website. You're probably going to provide this installer internally somehow, like a network share, or you deploy it through a script. You somehow provide it and, and reduce the traffic. So all the origin and the traffic, the certificate on the website, all that's lost when you get to the endpoint. So they base their decision on different set of attributes, a reduced sets of attributes. So. What happens then when um, a file is obfuscated? It's like if you are the security guard at some bar or at some bank, and you see a person with a ski mask and balaclava, would you let them in? Knowing that if you don't let them in and they're not a threat, it counts as a false positive even though you can't really tell from that picture. So this person, most likely, you wouldn't let them in, at least not in a bank, maybe in a pub, especially if you're in the mountains, because that's Andrea Lely from Microsoft, and I'm the one in white. We're just skiing. We're not going to rob a bank. But obviously, if you cannot determine his identity and his intentions, you might just rely on policies, default policies that you've set up, especially for that case. So when this information is missing, you're probably going to rely on a very conservative policy and not let him in. And that will cause a false positive in this case. But it might protect you in other cases. So the equivalent for software is packers. Packers are the main cause of false positives. People use packers to protect their intellectual properties, and they try to obfuscate and, and, and compress and encrypt their binaries before they ship it to their customers so that they can't edit them. 
Um, if you look at the top part of the screen, that's a clean file that is um, just not packed, not obfuscated. If you look just on the right, you can see some strings. You can see what APIs it's calling. If it's calling a, a, a URL, you would see it. If it's reaching out to a site, you would see it. Um, if there's some comments or some strings or some resources in it, you would see it. The, the one on below is the same file, but run through UPX Packer. It's the exact same file, but you cannot read the inside. So the security software cannot, at a glance, decide if this is safe or not. It, in order to know what it does, it would have to either let it run longer and observe what it does, emulate it, or decrypt it. So based on your policy and how restrictive they are, it might not want to take the chance to let it go that far. The reason we can't just detect all packed files is even though 90% of malware samples we see are packed, 5% of clean software we see are packed also to protect their intellectual properties. And that's way too high a number to just false positive on all of them deliberately. So we do try to emulate, we do try to recognize um, which ones are clean and which ones are not, but this is the main source of mistake. It's the same for web dev. Um, if you use a JavaScript packer, it's really likely to trigger the suspicious detection because nobody does that. Um, people who develop JavaScript tend to use minifiers to reduce the size of the code and the cost of the traffic. They don't use packers because those introduce bugs. They're not as good as they are on the endpoint, and they don't work as well. So if you do not use a minifier and you choose to use a packer that actually obfuscates the code, it's going to look really suspicious to all security software. So what you can do to avoid this type of FP is um, if you must use um, a packer, Try to reattach to your binaries something that cannot get lost, some information that cannot get lost. And that's done through uh, secure um, cryptographic signing. If you sign your binaries, that doesn't mean they're not going to be detected by an antivirus. Sorry. Actually, from the uh, 24,000 disputes we got last year, uh, out of the ones where we confirmed the detection that were actually not clean files, 35% uh, of them were signed. So that doesn't block detection for actual malware or grayware. But it does say that there is a legally existing entity somewhere that's willing to put their hand up and say, I made this file, no one's tampered it with it since, it's not infected, and I'm responsible for what it does. And you have to register a, a legal entity, it can be yourself or your company, to get a certificate. So the fact that there is this can uh, tip you over to the green side, because at least we'll know where the file comes from. That information will not be lost anymore through the layers. The other thing you can do if you want to use a packer, try to stick to the main ones. Um, a lot of malware use their own uh, bespoke packers. They create their own, their own enc encryption, and they create their own um, polymorphic ones. So every time they encrypt, it will give you a different binary. If you stick to the main commercial ones, they're more likely to be recognized by the security industry and less likely to be considered suspicious on their own. There would need to be something else um, that weighs in the balance as well in order for the, this to be convicted. Another reason for, um, for false positives is trying to determine whether or not something is malicious based on its behavior only. So here's a quiz. You are the security software on a mobile phone, and you have a new app that's installed. It can track the phone using GPS. It can lock the phone remotely. It can prevent a, a factory reset, and it can demand a passcode in order to let you use the handset again. Raise your hand if you block it. Nice. Lots of people block it. And some people don't block it. Congratulations, everybody's right. The one on the left is an anti-theft device. It's Norton. 
So you can remotely lock your phone if you've lost it or it's stolen. You can try to find it with the GPS. And if you find it again, you can unlock it with a code you've set yourself. The one on the right is a crypto ransomware, actually just a ransomware. Um, it's posing as a security software called Android Defender. It's pretending that it found some malware on your phone, which it hasn't. But it won't let you get past that screen until you pay them $100 to remove it and get a license code from them. So it's qualified as a ransomware. The point is they behave the same. So the problem is not determining the behavior and deciding whether the behavior is malicious. The real difficulty is to find out what the user thought the behavior was going to be. And that's really hard to do from the endpoint using code. You can't just ask them, oh, did you know this was going to be able to lock your phone? Um, users hate intrusive um, um, screens. So there's another example. You're the security software on an endpoint. It's running Windows. Um, and it's got an app that can list drives, list processes, download files, copy, rename, or delete files. And whenever a file changes, it uploads it to a third party in the cloud. Raise your hand if you block it. Two, three, four, five. How about now? <laughs> OK. <laughs> this is a backdoor not pub. It's the write-up for Backdoor NubPub. I took it off our website. I listed the most recent backdoors and took the first one that I found. Um, obviously, you can't rely on the icons. You, you will have malware that use legit icons. It's monitoring your files and sending them away to a third party. The point is not what it's doing. If you want it to do that, it's a backup software. If you don't want it to do that, it's a spyware. It's the same for proxies. You can have spyware that redirects all your traffic to, I don't know, your spouse or your boss or somebody who wants to spy on you. Or you can install it yourself because you need one. So behavior is easy to determine. But intent is really hard to match with it. So whenever you're creating backup software, security software, whoops, um, proxies, anything that can be misconstrued, it's really likely to trigger a suspicious detection. Think of it like if you go home uh, today and you see that a mover's truck is parked in your neighbor's driveway, and they're taking away all the furniture, would you find that suspicious? Would you call security? Would you try to call your neighbor? Uh, they're in broad daylight. They're wearing high-vis vests. It seems legit. Um, that kind of stuff happens all the time, though. Movers pose, pose as, um, no, robbers pose as movers. So it happens uh, in Texas. It happens in France. It happens in Mumbai. It happens in Arizona. It happens all the time. Um, and it's the same for software. So if you want to prevent being hit by this misunderstanding, what you can do is first sign your binaries. <laughs> I'm going to say it a lot. <laughs> it's really helpful. Not only it helps your customers because they know that the file hasn't been tampered with, hasn't been infected, but also over time, you will build a reputation for everything you've signed. So for example, if I see something that's uh, monitoring files and sending them to a location in the cloud and it's signed by Google, it's probably Google Drive. And the same thing when you're producing software. If you produce a lot of clean, legitimate software and you sign them with the same key, you'll build a reputation for building software and not malware. The second thing you could do is have a clear EULA. That's one way where we can determine what the user was expected to think your app is doing. So, don't go thinking nobody reads them. We read them. <laughs> we read them, and our algorithms read them. Um, if you have a clear ULA that describes what it does and why, why do you need to transfer this data? Why do you need this PII? What do you do with this? Um, it'd be clearer for the security industry to determine whether you're doing something malicious or not, or most likely that you're not doing anything malicious. 
And the third thing is visibility. It's nice to be unobtrusive, but it has a price. Always have some sort of presence in the endpoint when you're doing something. So if you have something that is monitoring a process, have a presence in the system tray, have a clear UI, have a way to show that the user knows what's going on. Like obviously, you don't want the backup software to pop up right now while I'm doing this presentation and say, I've backed up some files, congratulations. But stealth techniques have a cost as well. They do look suspicious. There's one more thing you can do if you're interested. It's proactive whitelisting. So if you know that you're doing something that can be misconstrued, or if you've had repeated issues with false positives, <clears throat> you can reach out to some companies and proactively give them your software or give them information about your software. Um, I know Kaspersky has a program. Symantec has a program for uh, Platinum customers. But there is also IEEE, um, the Clean Metadata Exchange program from IEEE that's hosted at Avira. This one's open for all the industry. So you register yourself with them. They give you a key. And then you upload hashes um, about your software and about your binaries. You don't upload the actual software. Then anyone in the security industry can go there and use them if they want for false positive prevention. <coughs> and it might exonerate some detection, including heuristic detections, behavioral detections. The next reason, the next most common reason for false positive is when you hang out with a bad crowd. So sometimes you might want to outsource the distribution of your software. You don't want maybe to uh, host it yourself, advertise it yourself, find customers yourself, or it's a small thing that you've done in your spare time, or it's just a game, or for whatever reason, you decide to use an affiliate program. That's OK. But some of them um, cannot be trusted, because they're paid by Insta. So they get more benefit when they have more installations. So some of them will try to maximize the installation by bundling software together and silencing some of the installers. So if they use your software and they promote your software as the main software and they advertise for it, but they bundle other things with it and the user is not aware that this other software is coming with it, that turns your software into a Trojan. That's the definition of a Trojan. Conversely, if they promote another software and they silence the installer for your software and bundle it with it, that turns your software into a potentially unwanted application, PUA, or potentially unwanted program, PUP, depending on who you're talking to. Um, if enough people call us to complain about a software that came onto their system, they don't know how, even if it doesn't do anything harmful, even if it comes with an uninstaller, even if it's per not persistent, we'll have to issue a PUA detection because that's the definition of it. It's potentially unwanted. People get it, whereas they didn't mean to install it. And whenever they update whatever they did install, that software comes back as well. So to them, it looks like it's persisting through an uninstall. It looks like it's uh, malicious. So if you are using affiliates, I would recommend try to provide your software as a standalone as well somehow. Uh, I'll get back to that, but it's easier to pick it apart from a bundle that people complained about if we've seen it on its own before and it's not always associated statistically with stuff that people complain about. Bundling is a problem. Customers hate it. It's a PR issue. Um, here is one where the screen, by default, doesn't show you a bundle. If you do the in express install, you think that you're just installing this software. But in reality, by default, it's installing another one as well. And it's not malware. It's not going to hurt your computer or steal your credit card. But it's not acceptable. This is bad practice. So 
software like this will always be detected. Um, people hate it. They, um, Oracle <laughs> has bad rap for this. Um, Google calls it worse than malware. Uh, people are creating tutorials on how to get rid of the bundles. Um, it's just really bad practice. They hate it so much that we have to follow through and issue a PUA detection. There, there, that's not the only bad practice. There's about 150 of them. Uh, one of them that's quite common is you ask explicitly, do you want the bundle? So that's OK. And then the person says, no. And that's okay. And then you ask again, and then again, and then again. That is also going to cause a detection. Um, there's a number of bad things you can do that are not malware, that are not harming the computer, that are not stealing resources or stealing passwords or anything, but will lead to detection. And you can get the list on apisteam.com. I'll get back to this later. Just Last thing on the topic of distribution methods. So a couple years ago, we had one software that was distributed by going to a website and clicking the download link. And then it would download to the browser temp folder and self-extract from there and deploy from there. It's OK. It works. But in 15 years in Symantec, that's the only legitimate software we've seen do that. All the other ones were malware. It, you could use a drive-by download to download legitimate software, but why would you? It, there is a, um, a proof way that everybody's applying to deploy their software. You download an installer, you go through a few screens, you accept a EULA, you decide where it should be installed. That's the right way to do things. It's OK to just stick with the traditional methods sometimes and not always innovate on the bits that are not important. You can channel the innovation on the software itself. Um, so for distribution methods, it's nice to have a version, even if it's just a trial version or a demo version, um, that's freely available on its own. Then we'll be able to see it out of context. It won't always be associated with things like bundles or malwares that people um, might have um, introduced in a Trojanized version, for example. Um, if we see the software out of context on its own, we'll try to pick it out from a bundle. It won't be 100% effective, but we will do our best. <clears throat> you can get certified to appesteam.com. Um, they check your software for 150 types of uh, unapproved behaviors double prompt, lack of an installer, confusing UI, bundles. And if you pass those checks, they give you a certification. Or if you don't want to get the certification, you can get the list of checks from their website and just respect the best practices anyway. That will have pretty much the same effect. Well, last thing that I want to highlight as a cause of detections. And these are not really false positives. It's bugs. So this is one of my favorite internal tickets. It's a little bit dated. Um, it comes from a false positive dispute from a vendor, a, a well-known hardware vendor that was selling laptops that contained certain software by default and an installer. And the uninstaller <coughs> contained a file that can be used to kill a process so that the uninstaller would run and would be able to remove this software. Unfortunately, when it is run without parameters, it kills everything on the machine, including the security software. That's just too risky to have on an endpoint that we're supposed to be protecting. And there's no malicious intent. So before I was making the point that determining the behavior versus the intent is difficult and the intent is important. Here, the intent is not as important. <laughs> the behavior is just too risky. So we did decide to confirm the detection on this one. They said, fair enough, and they should a new, a new version. Um, here's another one. It's a CVE from end of uh, 2017. It only really made the news early 2018. It was an audio driver from HP that was accidentally compiled in debug mode and shipped in debug mode. 
Unfortunately, for some reason in debug mode, it logs keystrokes to a clear text file on the endpoint that's openly readable by anyone. It logs all the keystrokes, including credit card numbers, passwords, and email. You're typing anything you're typing. And that all goes to a log file in clear text. That's not even from a dispute. There was no dispute there. As soon as one of the security researchers noticed that and told HP, they issued a new version right away. They issued a, um, a vulnerability disclosure. So they reacted very fast and very well. But to this day, the entire security industry detects this version of this driver. And they will always detect it, because it's just too dangerous to have. One more thing. Uh, Corrupt files. So this is a joke by Bill, Bill Semph. A QA engineer walks into a bar, orders a beer, orders zero beers, orders 999,999,999 beers, orders a lizard, orders minus one beers. OK, why do QA engineers do that? They do that because they know that by producing Unexpected input, you can get unexpected behavior in your software. Sometimes it crashes, sometimes there's a buffer overrun, sometimes there's something that can be exploitable, or at least um, a denial of service if you can cause a crash. Conversely, attackers know that as well. So when they are doing it, it's possibly because they're trying to trigger an exploit. So any file that is corrupt, that doesn't match its header, um, that is halfway downloaded, something that is not completely right, ha has bits that have been flipped during transfer, looks suspicious, because it could be an exploit that we don't know about yet. So anything that is corrupt is, is usually considered suspicious and usually detected. It can be like some documentation that is bundled in your installer. Sometimes the files get corrupted during transfer. No one notices, and it, ship, it ships this way. Or it can be while your customers are downloading your software, um, and the download crashes, and they don't notice, then it gets detected. And then they complain to you that the security software says it's malware. Um, it's not malware. It's just suspicious, because it could be an exploit. So corruption is a fair, fairly reasonable cause of detections as well. So what you can do, write secure code. <laughs> um, I try, you try, everybody tries. OK, so fair enough. But more importantly, react to feedback. Just dispute the detections. Talk to us. Talk to whoever is creating the detection. And we'll figure out what's going on. Um, just reach out to us. Um, that's it for the causes, but I want to go back to that blue jeans issue I was talking about before. So with blue jeans, the entire software industry nearly made the same mistake at the same time. This is virus total screenshot. Um, so that's a site that scans um, a file you upload with all main security vendors. <coughs> And on that day, it had 27 out of 67 detecting this file. The reason this happened is because the security industry hates malware. They hate malware a lot more than they love profit. They share all their samples. So whenever they detect something, whenever anyone detects something that someone else does not detect, they share it, and they try to fix it, and they try to achieve some sort of herd protection. It's particularly useful for worms, because the worms then can't spread if everybody is protected. But we do it for every sample anyway, that are not pro uh, protected by NDA. So, <laughs> so what happened there is that one or two companies made a mistake because the binaries weren't signed. Because signing the binaries is very, very useful indication of what it's supposed to be doing and where it comes from. And then they shared it with everybody. And we receive about 10 million samples every day to analyze. They're a lot less careful when everybody else already says that it's malware and shares it with you than they are when a customer uploads it to you. Because there's 10 million a day and one 
one way, and there's only a couple thousands a day from customers. So the systems that are handling them are a lot quicker and are a lot less careful if you already know that 99.999% of the time that's going to be malware because it comes from a malware source. So what you can do to avoid that is, um, well, sign your binaries, <laughs> all the DLLs that you load. Um, you can monitor for RFPs on sites like Herd, uh, Herd Protect or ViusTotal. Then you'll know everybody who detects your software, and you'll be able to dispute it with them or talk with them and reach out. Um, thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Just shout. Um, sometimes, for some reason. <laughs> it, automatically, mm, we can track stuff that use the same URL. It's, it's especially useful for um, grayware and PUAs. They tend to be considering themselves semi-legit. So, like, if you embed certain hardware APIs, it comes with a EULA, and then you can recognize all of them. Um, sometimes we check them manually if there's a dispute. Like, this is one of the, the things we consider when trying to determine whether this should be detected or not. Thank you. So we do both. Is it possible for black hat hackers to whitelist their own files? Um, which certainly a use case we've considered. <laughs> so to whitelist them through IEEE or? Tr so the way it works is you establish a trust relationship with them. So first they check your credentials, they check your email, they check you're registered as a legitimate entity. I don't do that myself, so I don't know if there's ever been a mistake made. <coughs> Um, as far as I know so far, no, but there's very little uptake anyway. Um, if a hacker tries to um, register themselves and impersonate an existing company, they would have to have already access to the right email addresses and to the right phone numbers and, uh, and names. Um, if they try to create a fake company, maybe that could be interesting. Um, once you've registered with IEEE and you've established a trust relationship with them, everything you upload is um, um, securely tied to your identity. So we don't have to trust everything on it, and we don't have to trust everything on it at the same level. So for example, uh, Symantec treats uh, Microsoft's submission to it much, highly, much more highly than anyone else's submission. Um, yeah, there are ways around. As far as I know, it hasn't happened yet. Do you want to try? <laughs> well, thank you, then. <laughs>